The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. If you're not running KDE, then that would be a big install. So Qtractor doesn't require a whole bunch of KDE stuff, but it does run on the same technology that KDE does. A um, couple of different things. Um, well, actually, who, who in here right now edits audio on a semi-regular basis? <laughs> Is it discolored? Oh, yeah. uh. So, so no one really edits in here. Is that what I'm getting, or is everyone just refusing? Oh, okay. Um, I don't know. That's a hard question. Okay, that's that's annually. Yeah, totally. What do you what do you use annually? Okay, yeah. Uh, what about you? What do you use? Yeah, yeah, sure. Depends on what flags you use. Uh, Dan, what do you use? You sound really excited about that. Um, <laughs> okay, well, I mean, Audacity is a great audio editor, and if that's what your, your frame of reference is, it's completely different. Because Audacity edits the actual audio files, the audio clips. It's a waveform editor. Um, whereas QTractor, you'll find there are, there are tracks in, in QTractor, much like one of those fancy mixing boards that you see at, in, in studios, audio studios, things like that, where they've got those little sliders and they're turning the singer down while they're turning the drummer up or whatever. So, it's a, it's a different style of working, and whether that's appropriate for whatever you're doing depends um, largely on, on what kind of functionality you need. Most of the cool things that you can do in QTractor for strictly audio editing, you can fake in Audacity. Um, but there are a lot of g cool things that you can do in QTractor that you couldn't do in, in a waveform-based editor like Audacity. So they both have their r strength. Um, but sometimes you might feel that you need to upgrade from just the straight Audacity projects. So at the point when you're finding that you're creating like 24 tracks in, in Audacity and overlaying an effect, you know, f so that you can have reverb last longer than the actual audio clip, things like that. If, you, if you're finding that you're doing that, then it's, it might be time to look at something that's track-based. So I'll get into that right now. I guess, first of all, in order to run QTractor, you, you need um, QTractor, but before that, you need QJack, or Jack, really. Um, so Jack is a command line application and a daemon that kind of runs and sort of manages all the different sound coming in and out of your computer. Um, and it does that very specifically. It was very specifically designed, as I understand it, for audio editing. So if you can think of it like if you've ever had like a, an old, um, I guess like a USB hub or even a networking switch where you can plug in lots of different things and then kind of tell them all of those things that you've plugged in to go to, to another place, that's kind of what QJack is. So um, people can, I mean, you can use Jack on the command line, but people typically just use it in its GUI form which looks a little bit something like that. It's called QJack CTL, QJack Control. Um, and it's a pretty, pretty simple application if you let it be simple. You can get into the nitty gritty and really make it very complex. I find that as someone just generating audio for fun um, and even for like multimedia productions like films and stuff like that that I work on, uh, keeping it simple actually works really well for me. So. Um, around the time of the Linux kernel 2.6.38.4, I think, because I remember it was right before, it was right after Slackware 13.37 came out. So that had 2.6.37 in it, 
So around the time, like right after that, there was this big patch. It was like, I, I guess, a 200 line code patch to the kernel that they made. And it suddenly resolved like all of these audio latency problems. So what people were finding before this 2.6.38.4 kernel was that if they were trying to generate, if they were asking their computer to generate sound effects like reverbs and stuff like that, they would, they would experience all this weird like skipping and stuttering in the sound and it wouldn't sound very good. So after they made this big patch in 2.6.38, uh, most of those problems actually went away. So if you read online, oh, in order to do audio on Linux, you have to have a low latency kernel or a real time kernel, that, that may or may not be true. I find for myself that that's actually no longer true. As long as I have any kernel uh, above 2.6, I'm sure you can see that too, um, 2.6.38.4, I'm running 3.3.4, um, then it just works. Everything just kind of like, it just, it just generates audio for me. Um, so that's a good thing. That means that if, you, if you're seeing online all over the place, oh, you need to look out for this and that and that, you probably don't. If you just do, if you look at your kernel, uh, uname space dash av on the command line, it'll tell you what you're running. And if you're running anything after 2.6.38.4, then you're probably okay to just start making um, audio. Yes, they do. Um, on kernel.org. I don't remember the exact path, but if you look around on kernel.org, uh, the patches are there. And I mean, if you're if you're doing like hardcore, like multi-track recording, like where you're actually recording y your drummer and your guitar player and your singer all at the same time on different buses going into your computer, and maybe you're applying effects while that's all happening, you're, you're probably going to need some of that. But um, I think you'll see just from what we do today that that really worrying about that isn't something that you're going to have to to even think about anymore. So that's out of the way automatically. Um, to start Jack sort of running in the background, you simply launch QJack control, QJack CTL. Uh, it pops up this little window, and you press the start button. And this is what you should see, is just you know that it has started. Yeah. Depends on the, um, yes. Oh, nice. What was the question again? Oh, yeah, Pulse. Do you need to shut down, the, the, the listener asked, um, do you need to shut down other services on your computer, like especially Pulse? Um, uh, up until very, very recently, I think most people found that it was better to shut down Pulse. As of, I think, when was Fedora 17 released? Like six days ago or something? Up, uh, I know for sure that they have got the bridged pulse and jack thing fine-tuned and actually working. So now you don't really have to do that. Um, no, it actually talks. The pulse and jack talk now. Um, I mean, I haven't looked at the code, and if I did, it would all look like gibberish to me. But as, as I understand, that is what's going on. It's, a, it's, a, it's called the, uh, the a Pulse Jack Bridge, so they're, they're actually talking to each other. Um, I, I, I think it would, again, depend on what you're, what you're going to actually be doing. Like, if you are doing multi-track recording in a live situation, you might find that you know, really fine-tuning it where you do shut down other services might be better for you, or just making sure that you've got a very, very powerful computer, you know, I mean. If I could follow up, the, the reason why I wanted to do that is because when I played with Ardor, mm -hmm. if I didn't know how to do something, I'd have to pull up a web browser, and as soon as I pulled up the web browser, it wanted to make some sound or something. Oh. And the plain pulse wasn't there, so it just kind of, it's almost a dual boot situation. Yeah. Controlling my sound, so it would be nice if they were both running at the same time. Yeah, I think previous what he's experiencing is that he would try to launch something that was then trying to invoke Pulse, and then Ardour would, would complain that, that, that in order to start Pulse, he'd have to shut down Jack or, you know, whatever. So I, I think that's been pretty much solved at this point, but very, very recently from what I understand. Um, the previous, 
previous two, like a couple of days ago or a week ago, I think most people were actually, for their audio systems, they were using a distribution that either made it really easy to uninstall Pulse or they were uh, using a distribution without Pulse. Slackware doesn't have Pulse. That's what I run on, so I, I never really had to worry about that. Is that the, yeah, I, I know the command you're talking about. Yeah, PA suspend will actually suspend pulse. But I don't know what, I mean, like you say, if you need to look up something online, will that then try to launch pulse and stuff like that? Well, so. I'm you just run PA suspend when you start a program. Okay, and then it's off. Okay, so suspend pulse, PA suspend. Try it out. Um, so yeah, that that's pulse versus jack. It's getting a lot better. That's. I guess the, the bottom line there. One thing you might have to worry about, um, and you might not, you might never ever see this, but one thing that the, the computer will want you to do is to allow Jack, and again, Jack is like this background layer that's kind of running in the background. You're never going to really interact with it, but it's just kind of humming down there in the background. Um, in order for it to do real time or near real time events, your computer wants it to have special permissions to actually perform those. Um, that's managed two different ways on, um, d depending on whatever system you're using. Um, on most, I believe it's managed with PAM, P-A-M. It is not managed on PAM on Slackware. Um, but there is a, I mean, it's, it's basically the same idea. Uh, yeah, that's it. So you might have to go into a config file and give it permission to launch certain applications with, with a, a, a greater priority so that the kernel doesn't constantly try to interrupt those processes. I'm not a programmer, I don't know what I just said, but all I do know is that there's like a text file on your computer somewhere that you might have to list all the audio applications that you want to launch with, um, with better permission than what like it would normally be able to run at. So in this case, this is set our limits, which is fairly Slackware specific, so you might not see this unless you're running Slackware, but there is, there's something very, very similar to this for your uh, PAM dot limits or security dot limits, something like that. It's in slash Etsy. And if you put in the group, the audio group is usually what it's called, um, and you're a member of the audio group probably, unless you've explicitly removed yourself from that group, you're probably a member of that group. And then you give it the name of the application that you want to be able to run with those higher permissions or, or priorities rather. And you give it a nice level of negative one, so it's not very nice, a, re a greater real time priority and some thing about memory and locking it and stuff like that, which I don't really know. I just copy it from, from online. So that kind of thing. So I put it on Jack D, I put it for QJack control, I put it for QTractor. And if there was anything else that needed better permission to run, I, would, I, I could add it there. But um, that's just like to make sure that Jack doesn't complain when you start it up, that it's trying to run and run and run and run and your kernel's like, what is this process? I need to do other stuff right now. You want to tell the computer, no, don't. I want you to just respect Jack and let it do whatever it needs to do. Any questions about that? So it's, it's set our limits if you're on Slackware. PAM, P-A-M, that already exists on your computer. You just need to kind of look into where the config file is that you need to change to add that program. And it, it quite possibly, if you're using a fancy distribution that's kind of geared toward audio production, they might have done that for you already. Like, quite likely they, they have that in their install script or whatever, so you might not even ha actually have to do it. But if you go to QJack control and you launch it and it starts complaining or it doesn't start or it can't start or something like that, that's one thing to double check. So now I'm gonna launch QTractor. And this is QTractor. Um, there's two different kinds of sound that you might want to play around with. Well, actually three kinds of sound that you might want to play around with in QTractor. One is like pre-recorded loops, you know, like a drum beat that someone has 
created and then has released uh, to the public for you to use maybe royalty free or whatever. A great source of that stuff would be like freesound.org. They're a great site for, um, well, for all kinds of things actually. They have, they have sound effects and all that, but they also have loops like drum loops, guitar loops, just all kinds of loops. So freesound.org is really good. Um, and that's all really nice because it's all Creative Commons. So you know that if you use that and you want to keep your own project Creative Commons, then that's, that'll all be sort of compatible. There's other sources too though. I mean, there's, um, there are CD sets for sale of just loops. You know, they're just like hundreds and hundreds of loops for all the different kinds of musical styles you could ever want. If you go to any given magazine store, it's a, a bookstore, it's what existed before ebooks came around. They're, they, they still exist in some places. If you go there, you can find these paper versions of ebooks and look in the back and there's like CDs full of loops and stuff like that. There's also, um, Sometimes, like I know that uh, I think it's computer music or keyboard, one of those two. They actually, at least up until, I mean, I haven't checked lately, but I mean, for a very long time, they were shipping with a bundled CD with their magazine that would just have a bunch of loops. I mean, it was kind of a, you just get what you take because you know you're just buying the magazine. But whatever you're looking for, you can probably find it. There's there's loops out there that you can use that you're allowed to use. They're probably either royalty free or Creative Commons. So that's like pre-recorded audio. That stuff is really easy to get into Q-Tractor. Um, you see over here, um, can I do this trick? No, I don't have that turned on. Uh, you see on the, um, the right-hand side of the screen, this big blank window. This is the files window. This will keep track of any files that you have um, turned, or associated, I guess I should say, with your project. Right now, our project's empty. And actually, I like to save my project first and foremost. Even though it is empty, I just like to get, kind of give it a home. So that's pretty standard. We'll just call it um, self2012. And we'll save it in my music folder. Okay, so now, now this project exists. I kind of like to do that just to, to instantiate its home on my drive. So now I'm gonna import some files. So if I just right click on this panel on the right and add files, I can go through my hard drive, which conveniently um, has pre-built loops that I was using uh, anyway. So I'll just import a couple of them. I don't know what they're gonna sound like. I don't really remember what these are, but we'll find out together. Okay, so they're, they're just dumped over here on the right. So this is kind of like my, my, my music library now. So I could just grab this loop, drop it in. It's like so groovy. Yeah, so you can just kind of dig through loops and construct a song like that. Well, that was a lot more than I meant to pull in actually. So you can construct loops, obviously, from this. And if you loop things that sound similar enough together, and a lot of times the loop sets that you'll get are specially designed. I mean, they're designed because they know that you're going to, that you're probably going to loop them around and try to construct a song. So if you do that, uh, then you can possibly create a new song from pre-built loops. That's the same loop, I think, that I keep playing. I'm trying to find one that's similar. Yeah, let's do that. So you keep looping that around enough and after a while you get a song. 
So that's kind of the, like the loop-based process. I mean, you, you'll hear a lot of people talking about that, you know, with like programs like, um, well, GarageBand certainly, which is, I mean, that's kind of like their big thing. You pull some audio files that they give you and you put them in different order and suddenly you have a song. Um, but I mean, it, it works. Like if your goal is to just mess around with some sound and make a, a groovy little song that you want to play for your friends, then that kind of thing works. And if you dig through your audio, uh, enough audio loops and put them together, you'll, you'll end up with something interesting. Um, and there are worse ways to kill some time. So I mean, that's just something that you can do. Looping the actual files, um, you can just do, like if, if we like this loop as our first loop, you can just simply do you know, a normal copy and then paste. And you'll see that it asks me where exactly I want to paste it. Or I can paste repeat, meaning that I know I want to loop this particular clip like eight times because I can't get enough of this drum beat. Um, then I could do that. But I'm not going to do that to us. I'm just going to paste it once. And then we've got you know, that loop. And then we cut to a different loop. That's probably enough to play around with, so we'll just keep it at that. So pre-built loops, those are really easy. Um, in terms of getting audio in from an external source, like if you play guitar or you play some instrument or you're going to sing along with these pre-built loops or whatever you're going to do, um, that's getting sound into Q-Tractor from some external source. This requires a little bit of patch bay work because Q-Tractor, I mean, depending on your computer, Q-Tractor doesn't necessarily know where you want the sound to come from. Like if you just hit record, well, we can't right now because we don't have a track for it. But if we were to hit record when we were ready for that, it wouldn't know where to look. We have to tell it, hey, I want you to be taking sound from my fancy external mic. Or I don't have a fancy external mic, so just grab sound from my built-in laptop mic, which probably wouldn't be the best sound quality. But I mean, if that's what you've got, that's what you've got. So to, to define those sorts of things, Technically, it's done in QJack control, which was, was that, that guy right there, the small, the small little guy running in the background that we get to ignore. Um, I don't generally go out to QJack control to do this, because that's the nice, one of the nice things about QTractor is that the same programmer writes both programs, QTractor and QJack control. So you can actually do everything from within here. So if we go to. Um, View, Windows, Connections. I have it short, a keyboard shortcut to C. That's not the default, but it's, it's a pretty handy one. Um, then you get a list of all the possible audio devices that you may or may not have plugged into your computer. So you've got, on one side, you've got your master out of QTractor. And it's going to the playback of your, of your computer, which is why when I hit play in QTractor, we're actually hearing it through the speakers. Um, these little lines, these little noodly lines between the two windows, you can imagine those as, as patch cables, as audio cables. And you're plugging it in from your synthesizer or your, your I don't know, CD player, whatever you might have plugged into a speaker. That's, that's what you're doing here. The capture device of my system is right now really, really simple. There's only one capture device on my system, and that's the inbuilt mic. So this is really easy. On, a, on my desktop at work, I've got like 80 different input devices. I've got like this sound card that has so many input devices that I don't know what to do with half of them. And then some of them are kind of fake outs because they're actually inputs, I guess, for my graphics card or something, which I, know I don't use that way. So I'm not really sure what all of them are. Um, what, you, uh, what I do is I just kind of play around with the, with the settings until I find, until I can kind of identify for myself which capture device is what, is what actual physical hardware th device that I can actually see on my computer. Um, if, if you know your system really well, you might already know that stuff. I, I tend to get confused about it. Obviously, in this case, it's really simple, and it is set by default to go from, from, the, from the microphone in my um, laptop over to the input of QTractor. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna actually record because I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure with all these different microphones and uh, speakers I'm, we would get a lot of feedback but I'll show you how to how to go 
right up to the very last moment before we set rec before we hit record. So you need to before you can bring in new audio that doesn't exist yet, you need to create a destination for it. And that is simply a track. So you go up to the track menu and you say add track and it asks you for some details about it. It's usually good practice to uh, define what, the in, what, what that track is going to contain. Uh, if this was going to be the vocals, uh, then that's what I would put in, that it's oikels or vocals. Um, it's an audio input, right? We're not doing MIDI yet, because we haven't talked about MIDI yet. So we're doing audio. The input uh, is, is the master input of, of Q Tractor. And remember that that's mapped to the capture device of my microphone. Um, so I should really just be able to say OK there. So now I've got a vocal track. It's empty. It has nothing there. These little buttons on the side of the, uh, of the tracks, RMS, does anyone have any idea what that would stand for? No, actually it doesn't. <laughs> Something else. What? Yeah, record. Oh, did it? Did it say that? I was hoping someone was gonna guess Richard Stallman. Yeah, but no one. But root mean squared was pretty good too. Um, yeah. So this is record, mute, and solo. So if we wanted to record, then we would just hit R. That arms the track for recording. It's not actually recording yet. So what you would have to do at that point is you would hit record, and I'm not gonna do that because I don't want the feedback. It would hurt. Um, so we, you would hit record, and then you would hit play to start the transport recording. So it's, it's very much like an old tape cassette system where you would you'd hit, you'd hit record and play, I think, right? Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. You'd hit record and play, and that, that's saying, OK, I want you to write to this tape as well as advance the tape. That's what's happening here. You hit record and then play, and it would start recording from the default input, which is that microphone on my laptop, which I'm not going to do right now. But we'll record MIDI instead. So um, I don't know. I mean, any questions on that? It's, it's it's pretty simple once you see it. I mean, if you've got a USB mic, it's the same thing, right? It'll just show up in your connections window, and instead of instead of just being called capture underscore one capture underscore two, it might look like um, I don't know the brand name of your USB microphone. So if you have like a, a blue mic, or um, that's the only one I can think of right now. But a blue mic that's USB, it would pop up as a new, as a new input. Uh, and you could select that and send it to the master input of QTractor. And maybe disconnect the one from the internal microphone, which um, is more often than not what you would want to do. You'd probably be recording from your external mic, not, not from the in, internal mic of your, of your laptop, unless your laptop microphone's really good. <clears throat> OK, so the other kind of audio. And this is kind of what sets QTractor right now apart from certainly Ardour, uh, well, certainly, certainly Audacity, rather, and, and still Ardour. Ardour 3 is starting to integrate some MIDI functionality, but it, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not there yet. Um, I mean, they're working on it, and it will be soon. So if you're just in love with GTK, you can, you can do that. You'll have just as good. Uh, just as much luck with it as you would this, I imagine, but it's just not there yet. So um, MIDI is um, a protocol, actually, that they invented, I don't know, like probably back in the 80s, where they started doing like digital synthesizers, and they realized that it was really complex for a musician, for a keyboardist, to be pressing all these keys on like eight different synthesizers, and they figured out that if they sent really simple imp uh, little pulses to each keyboard, they had 128 channels. They could send all kinds of music tracks to each synthesizer and have them start playing in unison. And you could then record them. And you'd have like this, this you know, symphony of, of different synthesizers playing in rhythm all at the same time without you actually having to simultaneously play everything. So it was a big deal. And it turns out that, it's, that it was written really well enough so that it's survived all the way until now and has even kind of crossed over to being something that you can do internally inside of the computer. You don't even have to really have synthesizers all over the place, right? So back in the 80s, you'd literally have like a big synthesizer, and you might have it plugged into some kind of MIDI uh, interface. And then you'd have that MIDI interface plugged into your computer, and you'd be programming all these little 
dots and lines and stuff that you want to trigger certain notes to be playing, you'd send that to the interface, you'd send that, the interface would send that to the keyboard. Um, you don't really have to do that on the, on in today. You can, but you don't have to. Um, but it's good to kind of keep that in mind because that's kind of the model that we're still using. So again, to create a new track, we would go to track and add a track. But this time, and we'll call it something, I guess we'll call it synth one. And this time we'll say that it's, it's a MIDI track. It's not an audio track. Um, we don't have any instruments loaded for this yet. We don't have a synth yet, right? We're, we've got the computer, but we don't have our imaginary synthesizer that we're going to play. So to get that, we switch over to this tab on the right called Plugins. And we can add a new plugin. And there's a bunch of different soft synths, like software-based synths available for Linux. Um, they're pretty much all free, but I'm sure you could find some that aren't if you tried. But I mean, some really, really good ones are out there that you can just install straight off of whatever repository or website you want to grab them from. There's a, a CAF plugin called Monosynth. There's Fluid Synth, which uses something really cool called sound fonts, which are like little tiny miniature bite-sized samples. So they're really, really small file sizes that sound like you know, huge like s s stuff that people sample like very carefully, and, and they, they sound like real instruments, essentially, being played. But they're a lot smaller than a, a big sample bank. Um, and you've got Two of my favorites are Y synth and X synth. They're actually really, really, I think one is a fork of the other or something, so they're really similar. Um, we'll just go with X synth right now. So if I select that one, it kind of tells me what different patches I have loaded into it. I don't really need to pay attention to that right now. But that's, so now on my MIDI track, I have basically plugged my computer into an imaginary invisible synth called X synth, um, and so it's kind of ready to go. So we'll go back over here. Now we can kind of tell Q Tractor what we want to use. So we can go down to what instrument I'm, I'm using. Right now it's set to nothing, but since I've plugged it in to the, my invisible X synth, I'll just tell it, yeah, I want you to start playing my X synth for me. And uh, which instrument do I want? Well, there's a bunch of different instruments that, that are pre-programmed into X synth. You can get into modeling your own sounds as well if you want. X synth is, is pretty flexible but we'll just grab the first one and we'll say okay. Okay, so now we've got like this invisible synth. We've got our computer pretty much ready to go in terms of controlling it. Um, the weird thing about MIDI data is that it doesn't really exist yet, so we can't do, we, we, need, we need to create not just a track for it, we need to create a, a, a clip for it. So a clip is exactly what gets created by default when we start recording sound from the real world but there is no clip for MIDI yet. So we'll make a new clip, which I usually do with this little graphical button up here where it says new clip. I, I think it's in, yeah, here it is, clip, menu, and then new. And then we get our, what, what a lot of people call our piano roll. So this is kind of like one of those player pianos like where like little dots are all over the, the page and they turn it on and it starts playing the piano automatically. This is exactly the same thing. So. If I grab my little pencil tool here, or I don't even have to do anything yet, I can just kind of audition it. So um, I, could, I can draw in all the different notes that I want. Uh, that, that's the aha voice right there. So, because we've defined it, I mean, we can change it too. It's it's MIDI, so we don't have to keep the aha voice that I, I chose uh, immediately. Um, yes. Okay. So MIDI wants to be changed. I mean, it wants to be saved. I should say, um, which I guess it just did automatically for me, which is weird. It didn't used to do that. Um, but yeah. So now, if we if we play this back, it should be playing my loop at first. And then my MIDI should come in, and then we should change loops. So, I 
And that's, that's what we've got so far. Admittedly, not the best thing you've ever heard, but um, you know, this is how it all starts. This is how hits are, are, are being written today. Um, so yeah, so I mean, that's pretty simple. Again, I mean, any questions so far? I think it's pretty simple, really. Yes? No? Question? So someone asked if there's an arpeggiator function. Um, not, not so much that I can recall built in. Um, I, I, actually, I'm pretty sure it's not built in. So, um, but if you get like a, a, a MIDI controller, so this is just like, this was actually really overpriced. I wish I could say this, this little thing is like 12 bucks. It was like 45 bucks, which is a really bad deal, but I needed something and so I just, I bought it. But anyway, it's really, it's, it's a basic little keyboard. Um, it's, this is not terribly touch sensitive. Um, yeah, in fact, it's not touch sensitive at all. So, you, you know, you get one velocity no matter how hard you hit. Um, but, I mean, whatever. It's USB, so you plug it in. Well, you open up the box and you take out the little disc that comes for Windows and Mac users and you throw that in the trash can. <laughs> then you take this and you plug it into USB. Um, if you're lucky, it'll just work. Uh, like, I mean, it's just working for me, but I, I think I probably have presets and stuff like that. It's not hard to get this thing to work, though. What you do is you go back to Q-Tractor, you go back to the connections window, where we, again, define, like, okay, we're sending a signal to our computer from something. We want you to send it to here. We're no longer dealing with audio, so we'll go over to MIDI. And MIDI. And you see here that we, I've got a MIDI through. I've got an LPK25, which is what this is, an LPK25. Um, and then I've got the default Q-Tractor MIDI stuff, which we don't need to, to worry about because we, we've got this. So we've got the MIDI device outside of our computer. And we're sending it, again, already kind of hooked up for me um, to, to Q-Tractor. So it was already plugged in for me. But if, if you plugged in your device, you got your track set up, you've got your MIDI data all configured, or you, you got your synth configured, and you start pressing it and you're not hearing anything, don't panic. Just go to your connections window, go to the MIDI tab, look for your device. It should show up as a, as a source, uh, as a, a readable client from Qtractor's point of view. This is a readable client because it's going into Qtractor. Uh, you, you click on the the MIDI channel that you want, or the MIDI data that you want to send, and you just connect it to this guy. So if I disconnect this now, I, I do have a preset set up. That's why it's just working. Um, there, there's, I have a patch bay set up so that if I have this plugged in, it, it patches it for me. So you'll just have to take my word for it. If I had disconnected that and if my computer was less friendly and, and let me do that, then you would not hear anything. I can, I can see? Um, and now we'll connect it, and then there would be a line there, and then that would happen. So it's, it's super simple, um, not a big deal at all. But what, what, what's cool about this, then, is that you can go in here, and you can say, you know, I don't, I'm not really feeling the... Uh, I can't get this, this quite right. It's awkward. Actually, I don't even think I needed to do that. Sorry, I could have just deleted that entirely. So we'll arm this MIDI uh, track for recording. We'll say that we're going to record, and we'll hit play. And as you can see, we've got the MIDI data. Oh, let's unarm it just so we don't accidentally record over what we just did. And it's just playing back. So um, the cool thing about one of these controllers is that they have 
uh, arpeggiators a lot of times. I'm amazing, right? I'm just like, yeah, that's, that's what these guys get you. So, um, and like I say, this is like a really, really bad, this is, this is not, I would not recommend this one. It's overpriced and under featured, but there are really nice ones for about twice as much, but you get a whole bunch of nice features, are, you know, better arpeggiators, more options, um, control over, over a lot of different aspects of the notes, touch sensitivity, stuff like that. So they're, they're, easy to, they're, they're easy to find, they're everywhere. They're, they're by Roland, they're by Oxygen, they're by um, Iridol, Akai, Yamaha, I think probably has some. And you just plug them into USB and more, more it's, it's very likely that your computer will just see it as a MIDI device and be able to use it to control a uh, Q-Tractor. Now since it's MIDI data, you can go in, once you, if you just approximate playing it in and you realize that you're not very good at playing, then you can go back in and you can, you can adjust things. Or you can say, well, I really liked how I started, but I hated everything after, after a certain point, so I'll just delete that and then I'll just you know, copy the notes with just normal control C. And just completely change, you know, everything. And that's kind of the advantage of MIDI. But, I mean, especially if, you, if you've got a tune in your head and you're not good enough on that weird piano roll looking thing, if you can just kind of get the notes in on a, on a keyboard, you can go back in and retouch them however you want them to, to really sound. Um, oh yeah, and there's one other thing about editing um, called quantization. So if, you, if you've got all the notes right, but you find that you're just like a little bit off on your time, you can go into um, tools, you can select the notes that are, are a little bit off, go into tools, and you can quantize them, meaning that if you, you know, you want them to definitely hit on, on the beat uh, on every, I think this would be quarter note, which I don't think would really, yeah, that would work. So we could quantize it to every quarter note, or if we had meant to actually um, play it on every eighth note or whatever. So you, you can really, and you can transpose, you can do lots of different things um, with, with any, any aspect of the MIDI data. Uh, including like velocity. So this keyboard doesn't have touch sensitivity, so you can go in and actually raise or lower um, how hard that note hits and kind of impose sort of a little bit of, uh, I don't know, humanity onto something that the computer's just playing back. It doesn't sound that different actually to me, but yeah, yeah, so um, there's, I mean, there's fluid, there's uh, sound fonts that do velocity really well, and you can go in there and, like, tell it, well, I really meant this piano part to be really, really soft, and then I wanted that big chord to be really loud, and you can, you can do that manually if you don't have touch-sensitive uh, keyboard. Um, let's see. How am I doing on time? I'm good. How many more minutes? Oh, perfect, okay, great. So the other, I mean, the, the really cool thing about, well, another cool thing about Q-Tractor is that you can do all kinds of different effects on whatever you play or whatever you've brought in, like if it's these pre-built loops or your voice, whatever you're, you've got in Q-Tractor. Since each one is on a separate track, it sees all of these as, as well, sort of like separate, separate instances of sound, if that makes any sense. Let me demonstrate something really quick, um, just to kind of show you the difference. So this is obviously Audacity, and I will grab something. Oh, 
Oh, I just tried to import a zip file, sorry. Just don't want to keep using those same sound loops, but I guess we will. All right, so here we have something in Audacity. Sorry, so you're just going to have to get used to that drum beat. Um, so let's say that we, we love this drum beat because we keep using it, but we want it to have a little bit of depth maybe. So we go into the effects, we go down to whatever effects we most like, and I think it'll be really obvious if I use a, a reverb uh, effect. So I'll, I'll throw a little bit of reverb on there, or a lot bit. That was a lot, but um, let me do that over maybe. Still a lot, but listen to, do you see how it cuts off at the end there? That shouldn't happen, right? I, like that does, that's not how voices or sounds work in real life. Like if you're in a big cathedral and you shout echo, you know, you'll hear yourself like echoing and it just kind of gradually fades out. It doesn't just like, okay, I'm out of echo now and it just stops. So that's how Audacity sees things. And like I said, you can, you can kind of fake that, you could say, and this is how I do it when I am working in Audacity. I just create another uh, track, stereo track in this case. And I grab the, the last note that I want to sound like it's echoing, paste it underneath it. This is like a common old like GIMP trick where you, you know, if you want sort of an effect but you don't want to screw up the layer that, that it's on, you can just grab that thing and then well, what you'd really have to do is generate more silence so that the reverb carries over. And then you put the reverb on this guy. I'm not terribly happy with this reverb. Tail level reflection area. So you'd have something like this. Right? So it just keeps going and going and going. It doesn't just it doesn't just cut off like it would if we had just put that reverb effect on that last note like this. It's nothing there. So the reason it's doing that is because, like I say, you're you're actually editing like the the sound file in, in Audacity. That's not what you're doing in QTractor. In QTractor, we are applying effects to sort of like, well, what we're really doing is we're placing a new processor, an effects processor, between the, the, the sound being played in the computer and it, it being put through your speakers. So you could almost imagine it like if we were going into here and, and adding a new panel for effects. So we've got our little, we've got a track with this drum beat on it. If I grab my mixer window, which you can do with view, windows, mixer, it pops this up. Um, and let's see, so we've got Can't see it. So we've got this track here. To add a, uh, an effect into it, you simply right click on sort of this empty space here. It's supposed to be sort of a little hardware rack, really, but it doesn't look like it. But it's, it's an empty space here. So if you right click and click Add Plugin, now you can add, we wouldn't want to add a synth because we're, we're happy with the sound that exists there. So instead, we'll, we'll add, for instance, a, a, a reverb. So I'll just grab the same reverb uh, plugin that we were using before. It's the Gverb uh, plugin from the Ladspa, well, from the Steve Harris set of Ladspa plugins. Here's our feedback. We've got our, yeah, yeah, we sure do.
Yeah, the, so um, yes, yeah, so the, the question was these, these plugins that I'm using are not specific to QTractor, and that is absolutely correct, yeah. So all of these plugins, they're, you know, like everything else in free software, they're, it's very modular, right? So you might install QJack Control and then QTractor, and then you won't, you'll, you'll go in to create your MIDI file and you'll say, oh, I've got no synths. Um, or, oh, I wanted to add a, a reverb effect, then there's no reverb there. Well, that's because you need to also in, install like the plugin or the, uh, yeah, the plugin sets for those uh, synthesizers or those effects. So the, a really popular one is the Steve Harris uh, Ladspa set. It's literally like 100 plugins or something. It's just reverbs, um, flangers, phasers, uh, just all kinds of effects, compressors, EQ, all kinds of different effects for free, and then they work. I mean, I, I, I'm using the same reverb, for instance, in QTractor as I was just using in Audacity. So it's completely, it doesn't really care. As long as that application that you're using understands Ladspa or whatever you need, Dizzy or whatever, then you can use that plugin in that application. So that's really nice because it is, I mean, again, it's very modular. You can, you can change things over like that. So yeah, um, Ladspa is one, CAF, C-A-L-F is another. Um, trying to think if there's a couple of, there, there are more, those are the two that come immediately to my mind for like effects like this. So the feedback that we were just hearing is because I had left the, uh, the microphone capture device on. So you saw that the solution there again is not really to panic, you just go to your connections window which is in the view, windows, connections, and you get your two panels of, of things that are happening on your audio uh, system and you find the the capture input that that is capturing the sound that is causing the, fees, the feedback in this case and you simply disconnect those two those two ports from each other and it's just like you're literally just going to a, an audio uh, recorder and unplugging the microphone so um, now we shouldn't get that feedback it's good so we've applied a, a reverb effect to this first track so if we play it back, we should just hear, if I've set the reverb semi-appropriately, we should hear some reverb here. Eh, that's not even remotely correct, but again, you get the idea. I need to put a much more, I need to dampen that, I think, which is that way. Early reflection, not so much. And dry level, we need dry. Let's see what happens here. It's better. I mean, it's, that's pretty reverby. But you get the idea, right? So as you can hear, like maybe you heard because I was talking, but listen, to, even after I play, even after I press stop, you still hear that reverb effect, right? That's because it's not, it, QTractor doesn't care if sound is being played. It, it's got that reverb on the track. And so if the sound comes through that effects processor, then it's generating the reverb, sending it to your speaker. And if you stop playback, you'll still hear that effect. Or if you, you know, if, you've, if, if it's the end of the line for that drum track, I'm gonna mute this horrible synth line. But if it's the end of the line for that drum track, we'll still, we'll still hear the reverb from track one, we don't have reverb yet on that on the changeover on track two, so we won't hear any reverb there. So you can still hear the reverb over that second track, right? So um, that's how you do reverb on a track-based uh, level. Now, if you wanted that same reverb effect on your second drum track, if you're trying to kind of marry those things together, then you can always just right-click. Um, no, you can't. You can drag it and drop it, and you can either move that reverb effect over to the second track, or you can simply copy it over there, and then you would have the same reverb effect on both on both uh, track one and two. Uh, any questions so far? I, I think that's most of what QTractor does that's unique from like Audacity and stuff like that. But if you have questions so far. Yes, it does have a metronome function, which I never use. Um, so I'm probably not going to remember off the top of my head where it is. 
Uh, I think it is in um, options, view options. And you can go to um, somewhere in here, I think there's a metronome. Yeah, here it is. So you enable the, the metronome, the different kind of sound. Um, I'm not remembering how to turn that on from here, though. Oh, here, actually, this little button right there, metronome. That should probably do it. No, I, I never use the, the metronome because that's just not how I roll. I, uh, but yeah, it, it does have a metronome. I've, I've, I've heard it before. I know it exists. I just don't remember off the top of my head how to turn it on. But. Oh, that's probably it. Yeah, OK. That, that would make sense. Let's try that. We'll add a blank track. We'll make it an audio track. This is good review for everyone, see? Um, and then we'll arm that for recording. And then we'll hit record. And we've got our metronome activated, we think. So we'll hit play. Perfect. No metronome. But yeah, it, trust me, it exists. It can, be, it can be turned on. I just I didn't anticipate that question. I didn't cheat and read ahead. Yes? Oh, sure, in view options here. Oh, thanks. Hey, great. Um, OK, Let's, I think this should work this time. No, still didn't work. Oh, I didn't? Why didn't you say so before I tried it again? Oh, OK. Well, I don't really have a, an instrument. I don't remember doing that before, and I know I've heard it in here. Um, I could be wrong. Maybe I'm, I'm thinking of a different application that I've heard it in. But I'm pretty sure it was here, because I, I, um, I just wrote a book about this thing. So it's, it's there. I, I, <laughs> it's, it's somewhere in my head. I just can't remember like how to get there. Yeah, <laughs> edition four soon is coming soon. Uh, any other questions not about metronomes? Any any question about anything other than metronomes? What, what if you want to produce uh, audio but then draw it down to the audio, for example? Yeah. Okay. So to to like balance the track essentially. Yeah. So that's a that's actually a really good point. So if you if you've finished your 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 composition, you're really happy with it. Uh, you want to then obviously export it as a file that you could then send out to friends or, or put on your musical player or whatever, burn to a disk, whatever you're going to do with it. Um, a lot of times that's called bouncing in other applications. So if you've, if you've used other sound um, software, you might call it bounce a track um, or exporting. That's my, that, that might be how you think of it. However you think of it, uh, what you need to do is create a new track for where the audio is going to go. And I don't know, I might actually fail at this as well, because I, I, I have not done this in a while. But we'll, we'll, give, it a, we'll give it a go. So you, get, you create a new track. I'm going to go ahead and name this one uh, Bounce, just so we know what it contains. And then in my connections uh, window, I'm going to pipe the output of Q Tractor to the input of Q Tractor, which seems really dangerous. And you're like, surely this can't be right. But it's, it's actually right. Um, so now if we arm our bounce track for recording, we hit record and play. Uh, we're at the end of the, uh, yep, sorry. Go back to the beginning and then hit record and play. You can see the uh, you can see the sound waves here, and you would just let that play through, and obviously you would let it continue through the very last moment of reverb that you want to capture or whatever you are you're doing, uh, and then you've got you've got this track that contains everything. So you've basically done a mix down. Yes, um, yeah, we can, should be able to hear that. I mean, it certainly looks like it. It should be there. Okay. 
So it, it gets basically everything you know in your Q tractor project. It's just it's I mean it, it is what we just did. We we took the output that it's sending to the speaker to another place of it, you know, to to the input of itself. So once you arm this as, for recording, that becomes the input and it records whatever it's sending out to the speaker. It's kind of like T, the uh, T E E on the command line. You know, you're 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 getting to send the the output to one thing as well as to another place. Um, so now what you'd want to do is simply export just that track. Okay, export the track as an audio track. So I've muted everything else, or I could alternately simply solo this one. It would be the same same effect. as an audio file, and you can save it out as whatever you want to. Here it's coming up as default as an AUG file. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do that. There's a lot of different options. Again, in view options. Uh, I think it's probably in, yeah, audio. The capture and export, I just have set to AUG because that's what I use. But you know, you've got, I mean, in real life, you would probably not be exporting, at least I wouldn't be exporting to AUG probably. You'd probably export to like a wave or, or FLAC, something that's not going to try to compress it uh, for you, unless that's what you're looking for. Um, and anyway, you simply export that track as an audio file, and, uh, and then you've got just the, the mix down of your audio in one track that you can distribute online or to friends or whatever. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, yeah, thank you, yeah, yeah. So I can't believe I forgot that, because that, that's actually a new feature. That's something that Ardour, oh, the question was, can you do automations in your track? Yes, you can. Um, that's something that Ardour has had for a very long time, and QTractor being, a, I guess, probably a newer project, has just recently obtained, but it's really, really nice. It's, it's really cool, and you can automate really everything. Um, so it, it's right here in this track, there's a, an, a little mountain range icon. That's the automation icon. So if you turn that on for a track, you can select whatever um, attribute of that track you want to change. So it might be simply you want to fade in um, on that track, or you might want to pan it from left to right, or something like that. You can do that. You can, you can make that happen. Sorry, I'm in the wrong tool. Um, you, can, you can do that with the automation tool, which is right up here at the top, automation tool. It's the little arrow with a star by it. You grab that, and then you can, you know, it's, it's, I mean, we've all seen this, I'm sure. You know, it's just saying, OK, I want, I want it to maybe start out really, really quiet. Using a mouse pad or a, a trackpad for this is not recommended by the way but yeah you can uh, you can change all that stuff what's really nice though is that I mean you can certainly have more automation than just one you don't have to just choose one attribute you could change the the panning at one moment and then switch over and pan and, and change the gain or something like that you can also change all the different kinds of attributes of any plugin on that track so if you want it to start out as normal drums, and then as it goes on to get reverby as it goes, you can add that as well. So you might, you know, alter the the reverb, um, the the tail uh, decibel level of your of the of the of the sound coming back from the reverb. So you can change that again. You just have to make sure. And this is the the thing that I forget all the time is to be in the automation tool. That'll that'll trip you up. Um, but yeah, you've got. Everything and that goes the same for for MIDI data. If you've got, if you want to change the velocity of MIDI data, you can do that with track automation. Um, you can even, I think, you can switch what synth it's it's playing or which uh, which patch it's playing on the synth. So there's a lot of stuff that you can do on the fly, just as an automation thing on the track with the automation button. That was a good question because I almost forgot to mention that. Anything else? Well, oh, 
Oh, really? I don't, okay, I haven't looked at that on hydrogen, so I, oh, the question was, can you sync, for instance, a program like hydrogen with Qtractor? And the answer to that is yes. I don't know what, how they do it in Ardor, but hydrogen and Qtractor both use the same MIDI clock. Um, so hydrogen is just like a drum machine. So if, if you really hated this bongo loop that I somehow found and assaulted us with for an hour, um, then you can just go out to hydrogen and make your own drum beat in a, a very traditional kind of like, I don't, I don't think I have it installed right now just because I've, yeah, no, I don't. So, but it, hydrogen is really nice. It's, it's, a, it's like having, it's like going out to the store and buying a drum machine and bringing it home. And you've got all, you can make your own drum kits and you can use samples to trigger different sounds and you can then loop those. So it's, it's a MIDI program. So it'll pop up when you want to, you, you want to pipe it into Qtractor. It's uh, something that would be available to you in your connections window uh, as an, uh, I think, I haven't used it in a, a, a while, but I think it comes up as a MIDI uh, device. That, that, so, so basically when the computer senses, oh my gosh, the MIDI thing says start playing now, then it, it'll play at the same uh, rate and stuff like that. So uh, you, you, you might have to set the beats per minute manually. I, I don't know if there's like a magical sort of like make these two play at the same rate, but they should play, as long as you've got them both at the same BPM, they should play at the same BPM. Any other questions? Yes. Mm. No, but that is actually something I was talking to Scott L. from the Ubuntu Studio Project about, that very thing. Like just saying, hey, what if we got G-verb or yeah, a guitar distortion pedal and said, if you want you know, crunchy guitar, try this setting. If you want cathedral sound, try this on G-verb. If you want, like you're talking to a tin can, try this. You know, you, you, and that's, a, that's a great idea and we'll have to start doing that. Um, I guess the talk is over, I'm sort of feeling, but um, f feel free to go to slackermedia.info um, or just see me outside at the booth. I'm like right across the way. And um, I, ha I have a lot of resources there for making music and art and stuff on Slackware, but it's applicable nevertheless to everything. Thank you, bye. Sound stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me 
uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, this um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Astris. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Astris, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astro or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astro. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, 
allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.